academia can play, because I would argue that independent research, uh, education and facilitation is a core resource uh, that um, serves all uh, other stakeholders uh, as well. So that's uh, the question that I hope we can revisit um, during the last panel. Here are uh, a few suggested areas uh, of, of academic activity. Uh, I want to highlight experimentation. We will hear later uh, in the afternoon from, from a number of initiatives, including Golf Lab, um, Stefan sitting somewhere, um, but also from Bill Drake and the idea of a clearinghouse. So you will see different concrete proposals that uh, academics, uh, academic centers um, can contribute as we engineer and then also implement um, the next internet governance ecosystem. So that's the introduction and framing. I hope you have enough reference points. Uh, some of it is quite abstract right now, but uh, I trust that you will make the mental links uh, throughout the day as the panels will pick up on uh, these topics either on the uh, you know, kind of more conceptual uh, um, uh, reference points around Net Mundial, or then also later in the day when we talk about case studies, best practices, clearing houses, issues to solution mapping tools, and the like. Thank you very much to the hosts. So now let's, uh, after this uh, very useful and important framing by Professor Gesser, let's move on to the first panel. And uh, the moderator for this panel will be Raimondo Yemma, who is uh, collecting the baton for the moderation from now on. And uh, he already called for the speakers for the panel to join him on the, on the stage. Good morning, everyone. I am Raimondo Yemma. I work with the Nexus Center for Internet and Society at Politecnico di Torino. I'm very glad to introduce and moderate this session on architecting distributed governance systems, theories, approaches, and designs. Uh, in this session, we will uh, further develop the items addressed by Urs Gasser in his previous talk. Um, with the overall objective to um, feed the debate on uh, present and future decision-making processes um, that will shape the evolution and use of the internet, we will do that using the specific perspective of um, what we call distributed governance systems. There are two main reasons behind um, um, the fact that we choose to address this topic. The first is more general and it is related with the fact that um, governance models that uh, shape the evolution, or, uh, the evolution of the internet are not the result of any deterministic fact of nature, uh, neither of um, an immutable technological choice, but instead the way choices are made do matter in a uh, dramatic way. And the second reason is more specific and is related with several uh, policy documents that were published recently, one of which being the one coming from the Net Mundial conference that was briefly described by Urs. Um, these uh, new uh, policy trends identify distributed governance as a model in which uh, greater localization of issues can be ensured, um, um, inclusive and informed dialogue can be achieved, and also a way to avoid situations in which a single authority sets agendas and decides on solutions. Um, so basically we would like to answer questions like uh, how could we 
could uh, distributed governance be conceptualized on the one hand? Do we need top-down definitions to do so? Um, to what extent distribute, is distributed governance a value in itself? Um, also trying to link these items with specific internet issues that are relevant. To do so, we are lucky enough to have four amazing speakers today. Um, Stefano Quintarelli, Bill Drake, Malavika Jeram, and Herbert Burkett. I will more thoroughly present their background as soon as it's their turn to speak. Um, unfortunately, we are not having Carolina Rossini and Antomello, Antonello Giacomelli that weren't able to join because of last minute in impediments. So we will use the next hour as follows. Uh, first of all, we will gather an input statement of five, seven minutes from each of the speakers. Starting from it, we will um, extract questions and comments that are relevant from the speakers, from myself and from the audience. Uh, so to have further rounds of interaction to um, discuss the topic. So I would like to leave the floor for the input statement uh, to William Drake, who is an international fellow and lecturer in the Media Change and Innovation Division of the Institute of Mass Communication and Media Research at the University of Zurich. Um, Bill Drake has also edited uh, what we can call a um, instant book on uh, the Net Mondial initiative. And so I believe he has many comments on what is distributed governance in his understanding and in which way it can be applied to the internet governance ecosystem. Thank you, Bill. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's very nice to be here. And my thanks to Nexa for hosting this event and inviting me uh, to come along. Um, I found out uh, about two minutes ago that I was speaking first, so <laughs> um, I will try to do my best to uh, maybe set the stage a little bit. Um, I think it's worth starting perhaps because we've been putting a lot of concepts on the table already with Ursa's presentation to back up and emphasize that we already have a distributed uh, architecture, a distributed system for global internet governance. Um, you know, governance of the internet is something that has to be understood in terms of, in my view, the broad definition of internet governance that was adopted by the Working Group on Internet Governance established by the United Nations 10 years ago, which said that internet governance involves the development and application of principles, norms, rules, decision-making procedures, and programs pertaining to the internet and its use. That is to say that internet governance pertains not only to the underlying infrastructure and how it is organized, uh, physical and logical infrastructure, but also to the varying ways in which electronic commerce and other types of activities are organized through rule systems uh, over the internet. When we, when we put things into that context, we're actually dealing with a very broad range of governance mechanisms. Internet governance is distributed in terms of issue areas, um, there's a wide variety. You could think of them as sort of vertically segmented issue areas. There's a wide variety of different issue areas where there are collective governance mechanisms in place. Uh, with regard to the infrastructure, for example, you know, you've got the, the systems in place for names and numbers managed through ICANN, the regional internet registries, and so on and so forth. The operation of the root uh, a zone file and the, the root system and the root servers uh, the, the whole process of technical standardization that takes place uh, through a variety of different bodies. The management of network security, um, you know, interconnection of networks. There are a wide variety of different types of uh, rule systems that have been established under different institutional frameworks to deal with each of these issues pertaining to the infrastructure. You could even go broader and say that there are a number of uh, rule systems that apply globally uh, that pertain to information and communication technology generally, but which have implications for the internet. And there you might uh, look, for example, at the traditional international telecommunications regime and the way in which it affects the organization of networks and interconnection and services and things like that. You might look at the radio frequency spectrum management regime because so much of the global internet is now increasingly dependent on spectrum. Um, 
you could turn then from the world of the underlying infrastructure to the rule systems uh, and regimes applying to the use of the internet for information communication and commerce. You've got rule systems pertaining to intellectual property, digital electronic trade, um, contracting, privacy protection, consumer protection. There's a wide variety of different institutional frameworks already in place. So we have a system that is highly distributed in terms of the issue areas that are covered and the institutions and processes involved in shaping those rules. You can also think of it as being distributed in, in other ways. For example, it's distributed in terms of the level of geopolitical space that you're talking about. Internet governance does not exist only at the transnational or global level. There is national internet governance through policies, laws, regulations, and other types of practices. There is regional, plurilateral, and other kinds. So again, we've got variation there. Uh, you could think of it in terms of the sources of internet governance. We've got arrangements that are negotiated agreements, uh, whether devised through intergovernmental processes, multi-stakeholder processes, or just private sector uh, collective rulemaking pertaining to different aspects of the internet. Uh, you have rule systems that are imposed effectively by powerful actors, whether it's a particular uh, nation state that has the ability to project its authority on a transterritorial basis, uh, and one looks, for example, at the ways in which the United States historically has um, had a governance role in relationship to the root zone file and its relationships with ICANN and, and uh, the performance of the what are called the, the IANA functions, the Internet Assigned Names Authority functions that manage the allocation of IP addresses. Um, you can look at the ways in which particular powerful firms in oligopolistic markets are often able to project their authority and shape a field. Um, there are other sources of, of internet governance one could talk about as well, whether it's global social conventions that have been established through practice that are recognized by members of the uh, internet community and so on. So my point is simply to say, first, first point is we already have a highly distributed internet governance ecosystem in terms of institutional arrangements and the, way, and the ways in which those arrangements are developed. What we're talking about here in this particular context is adding to that a layer of sort of horizontal cross-cutting arrangements that could be developed on a uh, demand-driven basis. And uh, as Ursa, I think in one of the slides, he showed a reference to the panel that was uh, chaired by President Ilvis and organized um, by ICANN and other actors working together, which put forward this notion of distributed governance groups now, the notion of distributed governance groups is one where you basically have people who are collaborating across institutional boundaries, who may be working in different settings, private sector, government, civil society, academia, whatever, who come together to try to formulate a solution to a particular problem. And they can be created and wound down when they're no longer needed. Now, we have examples of these already out there in the internet governance environment, whether you look at spam or a number of other cases, but it's also worth broadening the optic and saying, well, it's not just in internet governance this kind of thing has gone on. There is, for example, a long tradition in many other global policy spaces of what people have called global public policy networks, um, which are uh, essentially uh, similar in, their, in the construct. I mean, it's about basically aggregating capabilities, uh, skill sets, and expertise together into groupings, informal groupings, to try to solve particular problems. Generally speaking, not norm setting. I mean, you're not gonna negotiate an international agreement on this basis, but often implementation of existing agreements or create pooling resources to, to pursue a particular project that can be helpful in some manner. There are transgovernmental networks that tie together uh, actors from different governmental ministries, uh, whether it's agriculture or trade or whatever else, that work below the level of intergovernmental negotiations, but yet also perform a useful role in a governance environment. So my point is, there's a long tradition of creating these kinds of horizontal mechanisms for coordination and action. Um, there's a vast scholarly literature about uh, these, which could be drawn on in thinking about how 
<clears throat> we can do them more effectively. And what this project is trying to do is to step back and visualize these and say, what would be a structured, principled way of going about organizing these? How do we understand how they work? Where they come from? What are their properties? Uh, and what would be ultimately good or best practices that one could follow that might be generalizable? Can we create a sort of template or mechanism that could be used to tackle different problems that may arise uh, in order to add value to the internet governance ecosystem? And I think that's a, ultimately a very worthwhile set of questions to pursue, both as scholars and as policy um, activists or policy proponents. I would just close, though, with one point, uh, a caution about that. And that is, um, there's always a lot of concern in the internet governance environment about processes and whether or not they're sufficiently inclusive, participatory, transparent, and so on. We have, particularly in the internet infrastructure environment of ICANN and the RIRs and the other bodies involved in technical coordination, uh, a very strongly held tradition of bottom-up consensus-driven decision-making that is inclusive and open to all uh, participants. And if you start to tackle problems through sort of smaller groupings that are not really transparent or inclusive, you could have problems of political buy-in. You could have problems where people say, well, wait, I don't want to be a regime taker. I want to be a regime maker. I want to be able to provide input into these decisions. And we've seen a lot of sensitivity on the part, in particular, of developing country governments over the years uh, to any um, situation where it's perceived that some group is going off and making rules that the rest of us have to live with. Um, without having sufficient possibilities for engaging in those processes and ensuring that they're accountable, legitimate, and so on. So in constructing these things, we need to think, I think, not only about the technical challenge of how do you architect them, how do you design them to be effective, efficient, and so on, but we also have to think at the, uh, about the secondary aspect, which is the political buy-in, making sure that the international community accepts whatever may come out of these collaborations as legitimate and something that should be supported by all. So there's a lot of work to be done here, both analytically and programmatically, um, and a lot of challenges, and that's why it's an extremely interesting uh, project, and it's extremely interesting to have a network of uh, internet centers serving as the kind of focal point for this kind of thing, because we can amass uh, skills and, and perspectives from a wide variety of actors around the world engaged in thinking about internet governance. So I'm very hopeful that, and optimistic that this can be a very useful uh, activity going forward. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Bill. Um, I would like our second speaker uh, to react to this uh, first input and also provide her point of view. Uh, Malavika Jairam, she's a Berkman Center Fellow and has an experience of more than 15 years as a lawyer with a specialization on information technology and intellectual property. Um, I would like to know also, beyond a comment on what Bill Drake has just said, um, about um, the role of civil society in distributed governance. Are you happy with how distributed governance is managed nowadays in terms of involvement of civil society? And how would you design a system in which all stakeholders are represented in a suitable way. Thank you. Thank you, hi. Um, thank you to all of you for having me. Um, it's one of my favorite countries and I'm always happy to come back and always happy to eat Italian food. Any excuse? Um, talking about distribution, um, it, actually I should give you a little anecdote first. Um, India and the rest of the developing world are always on a slightly different planet when it comes to most issues but I think it's worth bringing them back into the picture to offer a very different perspective. Um, so the very amusing and somewhat scary episode that I heard about, this happened about four days ago in Bangalore, the city that I'm from. And um, the government decided to actually enact a process where they would engage with the public and um, seek comments on environmental measures. And within an hour, of having this meeting, the ministers and all the other government representatives basically turned around and said this is just a pointless, stupid waste of time and walked out. I'm used to civil society walking out. I'm used to 
Facebook and Google walking out when they don't get what they want. I'm not used to a government walking out on its own consultation when it's, even if it's going through the motions of trying to engage its people, I've never actually seen a government walk out saying this is pointless. I don't know why we're here. We don't need to listen to these people and they're not saying anything that's useful to us. Um, these were some of the most credible civil society activists. They were people who had a huge amount of collective experience. I think most of the environmentalists in the room had more scientific knowledge in their toes and nails than most of these ministers had in their heads. But that didn't seem to count for anything. Um, they were going through the motions, they weren't prepared to listen. When they were asked tough questions, they just decided they were going to walk out. And that made me sort of think that how does a top-down process like that end up becoming a bottoms-up where they literally lifted their asses and walked out of the room? And that got me thinking about this whole notion of distributed governance and unpacking the notion of distributed. So we have so many senses of the word and it feels a little strange explaining it to a country where everybody understands the Latin roots of words, but I'm gonna try. Um, so there are a lot of different ways in which you can think of distributed. You can think of it in terms of to deliver something, which often governance does. It delivers a benefit, it delivers a message, it delivers um, something that somebody didn't have. Um, it can divide something, so you can distribute something amongst people. So there's a notion of division, not necessarily equal division, but of apportioning something. Um, there's the notion of dispersion or scattering, um, as in, you know, you distribute something through the air. So that, that, I love that notion of it because to me, it distributes a method or it distributes a process, it distributes a way of thinking. So I think distributed governance can also embed a culture or a way of thinking, whatever the outcome is, um, in which case the process is as important as the outcome. Um, it can promote a message, um, it can distribute something to a specified individual, to a targeted region, um, you, can, you can also think of it distributed into phases, so it can have a chronological sense. Um, it can be a sorting or a categorization function where you think of, you distribute plants into 22 categories, for example. But the sense in which I really, really love the word distributed is in the sense of load-bearing or sharing. I like the notion of sort of like distributed computing, where you distribute a particular task across a network across a series of machines, or a mechanical Turk sense of distribution where you're distributing across an ecosystem of people and actors. Um, and I think all of these notions have very, very specific meanings, but I think when we think of the internet ecosystem, I think all of these matter. For particular processes and particular goals, certain of these functions might matter more than others, in which case you might gear your activism or you might gear your structures and institutions and architecture and design choices um, to skew towards those outcomes and gear towards achieving them. But I think all the other senses are also worth keeping in mind, even if you privilege some over the others. Um, there's also a very nice sense in which, in, in logic, you use distributed um, as a proposition to refer to all the individuals denoted by the term. And I love that inclusive use of distributed as well, where it refers to an entire class, it refers to reaching out to a community, not all of whom might have an equal stake um, or an equal voice or a seat at the table, but I like the notion that it still refers to all of them as a collective cohesive whole that you're trying to reach out to. Um, and I think the other interesting thing for me is when we think of distributed, we always forget, or we often forget, that with distribution often comes redistribution. When you carry out a process well, distribution can often ind indulge or uh, result in really significant redistributive outcomes. You can redistribute power, you can redistribute imbalances and asymmetries, you can bridge gaps, you can redistribute something as banal as money with an e-commerce platform. You can redistribute with Bitcoin, with lots of other things. You can redistribute agency um, and voices and points of view. And I, I like that notion as well because I think often 
when we think of distribution, we think of it as a linear, one-way thing. We think of it as either top-down or bottoms up. We don't think of it as a loop or a circle. And I really think that a lot of internet, govern internet governance processes fail because ultimately that loop is never closed. Um, you try to distribute a measure or a benefit to someone, you don't actually ask what that end user wanted in the first place before you decide to provide it to them. The person who sets the agenda has often not consulted with the person before implementing it. They may not consult with them to monitor whether it is what they want. They may not monitor it to recalibrate goals and outcomes. And um, often I think even when something is successfully delivered, you often don't close that feedback loop to deliver the benefits to the community whose, for example, whose data may have been gathered in that process. You may carry out a census exercise. You may carry out a biometric identity scheme. You may carry out all kinds of other things or you know, a financial inclusion plan, a cash benefits transfer plan, an employment guarantee scheme, all kinds of other things that may not have anything to do with the internet as such, but since we're trying to look beyond just the internet and look at other models of either a multi-stakeholder process or a governance mechanism, I would urge that the most successful schemes are often the ones where it's thought of as a loop and not a linear process. Um, a couple of other very brief points um, before I hand over. I was trying to think of other models and um, things that were inspiring for me. And um, what I found very amusing was I was looking for, I was trying to think of standards and standardization and ways in which people may have come together to achieve something that seems to work very seamlessly, does, doesn't show cracks, does, doesn't show pol politics and rifts um, on its skin, and that doesn't wear its, you know, heart on its sleeve in certain ways. And I'm not sure why I thought of this, but I actually started looking at standards bodies. I mean, we've got the IETFs and the W3Cs and the other kinds of bodies. But I actually started thinking of things like paper and paper clips and the nozzles of the things we use and the pipes that we use. And speaking German and having lived there for a while, I always think of the Deutsche Institute for Norman and the DIN um, synonyms for everything the acronyms rather, and I started thinking about the fact that some of our most banal activities, the fact that an A4 sheet of paper is exactly the same wherever you are in the world, it's completely seamless and visible. It's something that's agreed. But when I started reading it and looking into how this was achieved, the institute deals with something like 1,800 members. It goes through about 30,000 comments before it reaches a standard. But what to me was the most interesting aspect was the fact that a lot of standard setting by something that critical and scientific, it was entirely voluntary. Anyone could propose an idea and it could filter up through the system and if there was interest, people could take it up and work on it and develop a standard. I didn't think something like a paper clip or the shape of a bottle could actually be a voluntary process rather than a top-down government-led process. To me, that was kind of fascinating. The other thing is if you look at their website, it uses consensus way more than you would imagine and way more than a lot of internet governance websites do, more than a lot of political consensus-building organizations do. I've never actually seen a technical body or a standards body use consensus-building, voluntary, embedded, process, societal benefit, as much as this one website did. So to me, that was fascinating. And I think the, um, the third thing about uh, this body was the fact that they kept talking about um, stakeholders as well. Uh, and who were the stakeholders in, in all of these issues? And you think, does anyone really have a stake in the size of a sheet of paper? But the way that they explained it in their FAQs was wonderful. They said, if you don't know the size of a sheet of paper, how do you know whether it was going to fit into an envelope? And I think that, or you know, how do you know whether a nozzle will fit something? And to me, that was just something underlying so much, but it's something we often forget when we think about internet governance. Proportionality and fitness for purpose, and sometimes just things like size and scale. Um, 
And so the last thing that I, I wanted to say was, I think when we think of, so actually just, just to end, this is a pet peeve of mine whether internet should be capitalized or not. And there are all sort of lexical and semantic issues around whether internet should be a capital I or not. Um, you know, whether it's a generic word, whether it's a proper noun, whether it's now become so common that people don't need the capital I anymore. Then there's the scientific explanation of how it actually refers to the TCP IP protocol led internet, that version of the internet. But I think for me, the fundamental issue with internet with a capital I is the fact that it assumes there is only one internet. There's something exclusive about that definition and that notion that it excludes the idea that there are many internets and many people and many end users and many processes and trying to govern them all in a sort of Lord of the Rings wondering to fit them all kind of way may not be the way to go. So I think one of the great goals of distribution and redistribution is that we all get to have a say in what that ring is or what that process should look like and what that internet is for us. So this isn't quite following up on what Bill said, but I think coming partly from a legal background, a civil society background, a developing country background and being female um, and often in a minority, sometimes all at once, um, I just wanted to offer a slightly different perspective and I hope that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Malavika. I would like to now leave the floor to uh, Herbert Burkert, who is the president of the Research Center for Information Law at University of St. Gallen, and also a Berkman Center associate. Um, I'm sure he has many comments on what has been said before him. I also would like to add a quote that he can perhaps comment. Um, the quote is the following. While we may find new ways for making new rules, rulemaking is happening all the time around us. Since its very beginnings, the internet has seen its communicative potentials domesticated and its potential reach contained. This is a quote from Herbert Burkett and a blog post in 2009. I would like to know uh, to which extent distributed governance can intervene in this framework you, you shaped. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think there is a right to be forgotten, so uh, I, I rather would not want to be connected uh, in, in this context uh, to this, this quote. Um, what, what is in my mind is the, the, the statement by Professor Gasser uh, about the role of academia in these kind of rulemaking uh, processes, or let's say rather the role uh, of research. And I think the role of academia and research is uh, to be puzzled and to be concerned, of course. Uh, puzzled, uh, uh, for instance, when I, lately when I hear the word stakeholder, the image that comes to my mind, and you already introduced images here quite vividly, are people chasing down Count Dracula, uh, holding up the stakes. Um, what also puzzles me is the term architecting, architecting here, or rulemaking, or, or setting up processes, things like that. Uh, sometimes I have the impression that academia and research uh, are like children and uh, somebody throws Lego stones to the children to keep them quiet to lunchtime. And of course, it's a nice exercise to be invited to build and to construct, uh, but uh, the phenomena we are looking at, uh, you know, this space is already being filled Again, as Professor Gasser showed in his, in his slide, uh, there are a lot of entities uh, at work uh, in the context uh, of internet governance, and it seems to be somewhat naive to, uh, to me to you know, just uh, uh, do some Lego building, additional Lego building here. 
Um, the other image that comes to my mind when I look at this space is uh, the image of an aquarium. Uh, there are a lot of fish here uh, doing internet governance. Uh, some fish are big, some fish are small, uh, some fish are fed well, uh, other fish perish because of lack of oxygen. Um, some fish are red, uh, some fish are green. By other fish you don't know quite the color. Uh, and with this kind of image, um, I think, uh, um, and this leads me to the concern, we have a lot of descriptions how these fish came about, in which way they swim, but what we lack, and this brings me to the concern of academia, are explanations, or at least rich descriptions that look at the whole. Uh, of the aquarium. And I think this is one of the roles of further research and also of academia. And uh, I think in order to progress into this direction, and this is just one, one suggestion, is at the same time to take the notion of ecosystem serious and to be very or to, to exert a lot of caution with regard to the term of ecosystem. Caution because uh, I've chosen the, the, the image of aquarium on purpose because an aquarium is not just mother nature at work. There's a lot of intervention uh, by those who feed them and by those who put other fish into the aquarium. And the same thing is with internet governance. What is happening in, in internet governance is not just nature uh, at work. Uh, first of all, this is about people. This is about interests, and there are a lot of interventions there. But uh, recent developments in ecosystem research have moved away from a sort of merely biological understanding of ecosystems, but have involved uh, human interaction, uh, ecosystem research, and the images used there uh, moves into sociology, into politics, uh, politics research into political economy, economics. And there are two notions in this uh, type of research, I think, which could be useful uh, for our quest for thicker, dis deeper descriptions or even explanations. Uh, one is the question of equilibrium in, a, in the system. And the other one is the question of metabolism. Uh, again, I turned a little bit biologically here. Uh, equilibrium, uh, I'm here at a, a Polytechnico, so uh, you're aware that there are several kinds of equilibrium. There's, there's the ball on a plane, still. There's the ball in a bowl, rolling, but always arriving at the final equilibrium. And there is a ball on another ball or on a hemisphere, uh, which is in a very tricky situation uh, to fall off. And I think what, what we are seeing here is uh, an attempt of these fish to arrive at a stable equilibrium. But not just a stable equilibrium, but an equilibrium which they can influence according to their own interests and this brings me to metabolism. So what we see here with these fish is that they try to catch all sorts of sources of legitimacy. Uh, if, if you look, for instance, at the Net Mundial uh, 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 paper, you see references to human rights. Uh, you see references also, not to some extent at least, for instance, to proven track records. Uh, this is one of the reasons or, or one of the sources of legitimacy of the World Economic Forum. Uh, all the people that are connected there have proven track records of efficiency or of effectiveness or of other things. So there are a lot of sources of legitimacy and what's happening in this aquarium is that they are chasing for these types of legitimacy. There is a competition for legitimacy 
And what do they do with this legitimacy sources once they have caught them? They digest them or try to digest them into power and use this power to influence the type of equilibrium. So this is just uh, a not well thought out uh, uh, way of arriving at deeper descriptions of what is happening around us and I sincerely hope uh, that these initiatives that are happening uh, around internet governance, apart from descriptions which are necessary, apart from analytics which are necessary, apart from normative suggestions which are necessary, apart from dreams which are uh, very important, also uh, make more efforts to arrive at explanations. Thank you. Thank you, Herbert. I now would like to gather the last input statement of this session uh, by Stefano Quintarelli. Stefano Quintarelli is a member of the Italian Parliament. He's also at the head of an interparliamentary group on technological innovation currently. Besides that, he's a long-standing entrepreneur with a deep knowledge on not only the internet as it is nowadays, but also on its evolution over time. So I would like to ask him for his input. Based on Thank you. Thank you for inviting me here. I'm very happy to be back, back home. Uh, I used to be um, in the board of trustees of Nexa for a while. Um, and I'm not a politician, I'm a computer scientist. I wanted to say some things, but I'm going to change what, I, what I'm going to say. So. Uh, I'm sitting in the parliament right now. We are about 1,000 MPs in Italy, and we are just three computer scientists. And, uh, and there is about, I don't know, 45% of lawyers and, uh, or 65% of lawyers. There is the parliament there is, and there is the government. What we are seeing now in the Italian government is a race to, to influence persons for the government to be those fishes that try to alter the equilibrium, to change, to, 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 to go for another, to reach for another equilibrium. And uh, it is quite, I don't know how to say it. Well, it, it, the, 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 the present representative in ICANN of the Italian government is uh, a lawyer uh, who is uh, an expert of copyright issues and nominated by the Italian Ministry of Culture. And, well, the, the internet is, the te technology is something that goes across all areas, but governments are, are organized by silos. And therefore, all of these silos are competing, and the Ministry for Economic Development is competing in the, against the one for culture no, no, to nominate a person, etc. So really, this thing has to go across all sectors of government and uh, uh, to be a priority of the prime minister, which of course is very difficult because the internet is now, uh, as considers itself, is a very tiny piece of the economy. Now, if you take, uh, 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 no, no, I'm not saying that it is, an, uh, it influences, it's, it's the basis of the economy, I'm going to come back on this, of course, but from seeing from the perspective, I mean, for example, the, the, the tourism sector. Obviously, the tourism sector depends everything on, on the internet, but it's a, a different sector, so it's, it's considered a tiny part. And, and, and there are so many problems, and there are so many issues that the government has to, de has to deal with, that the, the, the attention that a government can have towards the internet-related issues is, 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 not, is not big, and, and is not huge, and, 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 these, uh, and with respect, uh, all the different ministries have departments where pushed by some lobbies or different interests, these ministers compete in order to get to the regulatory tables of the many uh, organizations that we have. And of course they are competing and they don't have a holistic view of, of, of the thing. They are just very, very narrow and very short-term interests. Uh, so this is the context in my view as seen from inside. 
we already have a, a distributed governance system. I am not very happy on, on, on how, are we happy on how this distributed government is, governance system is performing? If I look at things like uh, IPv6 VV6, uh, deployment, uh, I must say that it, it has been a total failure. We are, we, we are out of other space, we have a technical solution in place from years, and we have not been able to put it in, in place. Not to talk about net neutrality issues and all the tensions in the parliament and the government and look at Europe between the, the European Parliament and the Commission and the proposals by Mrs. Croes that was, I mean, there is a lot of tension there and um, the issues about copyright enforcement, uh, if we see how it has evolved more or less the same all around the globe, the, with the, first with the three strikes in France and then well, with the, the, the filtering of sites and the DNS poisoning and all this stuff. I, I'm not happy. I'm not happy because these are examples of how the persons that are making rules in this space do not understand really how uh, the internet works. So my call is to have more computer scientists and network people in the parliament, in the government, uh, because we need to raise consciousness. Uh, Governance is about use, and uh, I like very much the, the cartoon that Urs show, because that's building a house, but we have, we have not a, a common shared vision now of how the house should develop. And, and I believe that this is a problem. I mean, it was very easy when we were just tech, technical people and we had very clear what the plan being should be. But now the thing has, has grown larger and larger and impacting uh, a lot of the economy. Uh, I believe that the internet is the immaterial dimension of existence. So I don't like to talk about virtual and real. Everything is real. We have material and immaterial. And the immaterial dimension is not uh, alternative to the material dimension. So that's why it's, it's very complicated. So the internet is the material dimension of everything, of the economy. And I'm trying to push that concept. But the, material, the, the immaterial rules are very different from the material rules because we have no frictions. And it's a fact, studied by Brian Arthur, that it may lead to monopolies. In the best case, oligopo oligopolies. I don't know how to say that in English, okay. Uh, but now, the immaterial dimension has become the user interface of the material dimension. Three quarters of the Italian incoming and tourism are mediated by just two companies. That, and, and, uh, and the fiscal aspect that now governments are looking for, drop me some taxes before leaving, uh, before leaving the money, before having the money leave, uh, is just the tip of the iceberg, because what we are seeing uh, is uh, a complete redefine of, the, uh, of how we access to the material world and how we interact with material world, mediated by the immaterial dimension. Uh, and in this immaterial dimension, we have seen, well, I, I love the internet. I, I used to say that I love the internet, but I don't love the, the present internet. I'm, um, I like the, inter the, the idea of the internet that we had a long time ago when we had interoperable system, where you could, you could have uh, uh, any mail server you wanted, any mail client you wanted, interoper interoperating between them. If you, if, suppose we don't have the email now and somebody comes with the, an email system, it would be designed as a silos, so when you have to register to that, and if you want to send email, everybody needs to be uh, registered to that site, and, uh, and that, of course, leads to network effects and lock-ins, and we are building silos. So we're focusing a lot on the, on the interoperability, on the plumbing layer, on the first layer of the cake, but there is a, an issue that we're, we're focusing on the roads that lead to the shopping center and, that, and the shopping malls are getting larger and larger. And for many, many people, the internet is just the shopping malls. And uh, so what's the common house that we are looking for, that we are building? What's our view of, 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 of how it should uh, develop? I believe that the academia has uh, had a, an important role that the way how mail servers started and the web started, etc., was defined by academia. 
the present world of silos is defined by venture capitalists, because of course if you become, now they call it world domination, now if you become the world dominance in one service, then you will go, you're going to have huge returns. I believe that we don't have to believe that this kind of situation is going to last forever, and we should not take it for granted, because it has evolved in the last 10 years or so. And uh, uh, if you recall, about 20 years ago, we could not port a number, a telephone number from one operator to the other. As a matter of fact, we had just one operator. But then when the competition started for a while, there were many operators, but you could not move the, the, the use. It was the politics that decided that we wanted to have competition, so that common house should be more competition and more interoperability. And then we had a technical solution for that. And I, and, uh, I repeat it. Uh, we are just about 10 years since the internet has taken the shape that it has developed, and we should not take for granted that this is the right thing. And I believe there, there is going to be a, a larger intervention by governments uh, on this, uh, by politics. The, the very issue, the, the issue about net neutrality is an issue about user choices, consumer choices, and not having things imposed by large corporations. This is the essence of the net neutrality. It's moving, because of course we have rules to prevent monopolies mis misbehaving. We have antitrust rules, but these the, require too, uh, uh, too many years. Uh, there are antitrust cases that go on for 10 years before they conclude. So anti and net neutrality is preventing, uh, give, structurally preventing, ex ante preventing the possibility of having uh, uh, monopoly abuses. And I believe that we should not just focus on the plumbing, so just for the vision of the common house, but we should go some layers above. And we must say that interoperability, freedom of choice by the user, are values not only at the network layer, but uh, uh, at application layer as well. Uh, in this space, of course, we have tensions because we, are, we have different, va different core values, the US and Europe, we have different core values and we have different interpretation about privacy laws and uh, about competition. But then the fact that the, the fiscal fact the, 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 revenue, the, the, the tax revenue flow is just the, the tip of the iceberg. The point is that in the in material dimension, players tend to monopoly, and these monopolies are the, the user interface of the material dimension, where government has have uh, their uh, their normal uh, authority. Uh, I believe that politics is going to to increasingly go after the internet regulation, and we must deal with the fact that uh, we need to, to take into account the fact that the, the present development of how the internet above the network layer has developed is not with this what is socially desirable for, uh, for states. So I believe that Europe is going to grow on this. What we are seeing against Google, etc., are just signals of this larger phenomena. And uh, so the, the, the institutions are going to play, uh, the political institutions are going to play a larger role in the architecture of the governance, and that's why I'm calling for more uh, computer scientists in, in, uh, in politics in the parliament. Uh, and, and that's it. I wrote a small essay that is published on, on the next and now on, on these issues, these topics, in English as well. And my written English is better than my spoken one. Thank you, Stefano. Thank you. Any, any, any reactions? Okay. So, yes, of course. Is there any question or comment from the audience as well? Is there a mic? Yes, there is a microphone in, in the room in case. But I don't see anyone asking to speak. Okay. 
Yes, of course. Um, perhaps Malavika had a quick comment on what Herbert Brook had said. Just housekeeping note, we have roughly five minutes, and then we will have to wrap up. What was really interesting was when you were talking about the aquarium metaphor. Um, I had been looking through the matrix, so for those of you who weren't around yesterday, we discussed a matrix for how we would do the case studies and the kinds of things we would um, look at in evaluating and describing um, various mechanisms. And almost all of them actually remind me of something, and it's not an aquarium, it's actually the human body. So every single thing you mentioned here, all of the qualities about purpose, size, timing, resources, accessibility, linking, coupling, management, internal architecture, sharing, accountability mechanisms, control mechanisms, knowledge management, decision-making processes, motivation management, um, adaptability, efficiency, visibility, fairness, um, and especially viability and resilience. When I was reading these last night, they all reminded me of how perfectly the human body works at doing all of these and how the brain controls a lot of this, but how it delegates and distributes a lot of this governance to the other organs. And I was trying to figure out, and it actually written down in my notes, whether distributed governance exists in the state of nature. And it was a question mark that I'd asked. And you actually answered it when you mentioned this aquarium metaphor by saying that it is a controlled thing. It doesn't function in the wild, and it's something that's very carefully curated and created, and it's a very artificial structure. And that I just wanted to mention this body metaphor because that point reminds me why this isn't like the body. So I just wanted to point that out and say, although your structure is so much like the body, the fact that the aquarium is artificial and needs a lot of effort to keep it alive in a technical and artificial way is very different from the way we keep human bodies alive, and maybe there are some lessons there. Yeah, I think I, I was not so much referring to the human body, but to the fish body, but let's say those are artificial fish, right? Uh, so we, we consult, but uh, what puzzles me, or not <laughs> continues to puzzle me and concerns me, is what we also should achieve is to, to bring together uh, these various levels from which we look at the problems. Uh, there, there is your level, you know, from from the person, uh, of the person being confronted uh, with the internet and the need of the, the lawmaker and the need of the parliamentarian representatives uh, to react and not just like the economist uh, to stand back and see, okay, let's see, you know, how, how this works out. At the same time, looking at the economy tells us, uh, like, like you mentioned, that things change very fast. But, you know, the, the, the lawmaker uh, is like uh, a Samaritan, you know. He cannot wait until the person that's on the ground uh, may be healed by the inner forces of his or her nature. There is the need to intervene on this level. Uh, on the other level, what uh, uh, Bill has been describing are these uh, subtle mechanisms uh, of politics. And uh, from the academic uh, viewpoint, we are part of this game. Uh, we are part of the political game. We have our own interests. So we have this level. And then we have the level of standing above this a sort of meta level. Uh, you know, watching them all, you know, fighting with each other, reacting to each other, and, you know, trying to, to arrive at a sort of, sort of general picture. And how we, can, how we can fold this all together, that meaningful uh, participation uh, is possible, that knowledge is distributed in an adequate way so that we have a sort of educated and not merely sort of reactive discussion is, is a difficult task. 
as a very difficult task. And uh, what, what concerns me is that these discussions about internet governments sort of explode into different directions with regard to these levels without being able to maintain or to keep these levels together. Uh, that in, in the policy documents you can recognize the individual concern for, for example. Uh, that in the individual concern you can recognize uh, the big themes that are being discussed. So, again, I think this is a task uh, 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 for those who, and, and again I want to move away a little bit from the term academ acad academia. Uh, for all those who are concerned with understanding and communicating uh, about these issues. Thank you, Herbert. I think yours was the best way to wrap up this session. Uh, unfortunately, time is against us, but I would like to thank once again our speakers and the audience for participating in this session. And um, it's now time for a 15 minutes coffee break. Thank you all. Thank you very much.